And now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be truly acceptable in your sight. For we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I remember very well once visiting a dear woman from a congregation I was serving a dozen years or so ago who lived in a nursing home. Uh, She's gone now, but at the time she had some form of dementia that had taken her sense of place and time and turned them upside down. She recognized people, but she couldn't recall anyone's name anymore. We had a pretty good visit, and then I, I took her hands to pray with her, as I had done a number of times before when I visited her, and it was then that she did something I thought was remarkable. Before, before I could even begin my prayer, she began spontaneously praying the 23rd Psalm. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. She prayed it from beginning to end, never missing a word, and I thought, how amazing. Uh, When nearly everything, including the names of her own children, were gone from her mind, that psalm was still there, intact, complete. It's such such a confident testimonial of a poem in in the face of a life that's anything but easy the psalmist has made the psalmist's peace with the valley of the shadow of death the psalmist knows there's uh, evil encamped around but still there is a table set by a benevolent god the psalmist's cup overflows and to top it off The psalmist adds, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What an expression of hope. But note that English word follow isn't strong enough. The original Hebrew word uh, is radap, which is literally translated pursue. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all my life. It's a hunter's word. The psalmist who's been pursued by enemies finds now that uh, he or she is pursued by the creator and sustainer of the universe. The God the psalm writer is talking about is not like some supreme Greek god named Zeus sitting indifferently up on lofty Mount Olympus. No, this God is irrepressibly benevolent. This God... uh, in the most mysterious way, pursues us with goodness and with mercy. Dorothy Day, the late editor of the Catholic Worker magazine, speaks eloquently of that kind of goodness, the one that pursues us and will not let us go in her memoir called The Long Loneliness. And in that book, she attests to a curious kind of malaise that came upon her early in her life in the 1920s when she was running around with some of the notables of her day, people like the socialist John Reed, born in Goose Hollow, and Eugene O'Neill, the dramatist. She says, something happened to me when I was around 25. I had lived a full and active life. I had met so many good people, interesting, intelligent people. But she said, I yearn for something else than a life of parties and intense political discussion. When I fell in love with my husband, I thought it was solid love that I had been seeking. But I began to realize it wasn't the love between a man and a woman that I was hungry to find. When I became pregnant, I thought it was a child I'd been seeking, motherhood. But I realized that that wasn't the answer either. I loved my husband. I was as happy as I'd ever been when pregnant, and when our daughter Tamar was born, I was almost delirious with joy, and I could hold and hold and hold her and feel that with her in my arms, my life's purpose had been accomplished. But only for so long did I feel like that, I have to admit. No, she said, it wasn't restlessness. I was happy, but my very happiness made me know that there was a greater happiness to be obtained from life than any I had ever known. So her marriage and her motherhood were like spires on the most lofty cathedrals of Europe, which are glorious in themselves, which, but which serve to point to 
a goodness and a gloriousness beyond to the, the great architect of life itself. Her very happiness had pointed her way beyond. It had, in fact, put her on what I would call a trajectory of hope. And so this sermon is about hoping. Jesus was one asked, once asked the question, what is the kingdom of heaven like? And so casting about for some familiar homey detail that might open a window for those listening, he said, it's like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone finds to his great surprise, and he hides it and sells everything he owns to buy that field. And then Jesus paused and thought a bit more, and he said, no, no, let me go one better. It's actually like a seller of pearls, someone who already traffics in treasures, who in his travels comes across a, pe a pearl of such size and such color and such incredible value, a pearl he had no idea even might exist. And what does he do? He goes home and he sells all the pearls he once treasured, all the jewels he prized before this moment to buy this one supreme jewel. This is the trajectory I'm talking about. And this bit of optimism, you know, comes to us from Jesus, a, a man who was on his way to Jerusalem and not on vacation either. Uh, Jesus knew in his bones that once he got there, his life wasn't going to be worth two copper coins. But in his heart, I'm sure he also believed those words from the psalm, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, my cup still flows over. What we have in the 23rd Psalm is not mindless happy talk. It, it acknowledges the stark topography of the valley of the shadow of death. It speaks of enemies who threaten. Yet in the face of real terror, the psalmist attests to the bounty of life and the abundance on the table God continues to set before us every day. And note also that the hope expressed there is a deeply relational hope. It says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The great French philosopher Paul Claudel put it perfectly when he said, Jesus came not to banish suffering, but to fill it with his presence. So he gives us the whole truth of the 23rd Psalm in one line, which is what all good poets do. And this is interesting and I think seminal for Christians because, you know, the Buddha, in contrast to Jesus, came to banish suffering. He made no bones about it. Buddhism is all about finding a way around suffering or perhaps even to find a way to triumph over suffering's power, which is all fabulous. I find much of the wisdom of Buddhism to be indispensable. Um, but in regard to suffering, it does not take Christianity's way. Christianity looks at suffering square on, knows what it does, but knows it also to be a potent catalyst for bonding human beings to one another. It does not dismiss it or disengage from it. It, it embraces it, in fact, and, and fills it with the same purpose that imbued the life and teachings of Jesus. So it's true. In this world, I mean, we're in the middle of this unspeakable war. In this world, terrible things happen, unspeakable things. But it is also true that in this world, good happens. Do we dare account for that? So many skeptics are so very willing to dismiss any notion of the existence of a loving God because of the presence of evil in the world. All those books by popular atheists that so, uh, sold so well 15, 16 years ago, harp harp on this. I, re I read Sam Harris and Chris Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, and they each of them in their own way rail against a, a fundamentalist version of Christianity that I personally, as you know, have little use for. Right-wing Christianity is, is such an easy target, though, and has always been, but all three of those atheist naysayers simply, simple-mindedly throw the baby Jesus out with the bathwater. I mean, none of them even addresses the robust spirituality that Jesus espoused in the last years of his sweet life. 
Now, Jesus had similar trouble with the critics of his own day. And so the text uh, that Stan read to us today from John's Gospel, which is paired with the 23rd Psalm in the lectionary, is reflective of this. Remember, it goes, So the authorities gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, just tell us. And Jesus shook his head at these fellows who only see life in black and white, who make up their minds about a thing before really considering it with their hearts, who are so fundamental and miss by a mile what's really important, and who just want to be led like, frankly speaking, unthinking sheep. They watched how he worked with people with a compassion that had no equal. But where do they come down with it? He spoke to these scoffers about how there were less educated folk who saw his gentle winsomeness, felt his touch, tried to measure the size of his heart, and couldn't because it was so immeasurable, and then followed him because they couldn't help themselves. Of these, he said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow. The religious authorities could not understand why Jesus paid the poor any attention at all, though. That's the bottom line from this text. They believed God only cared for the well-off like themselves, who they considered to be blessed, right? Because, of course, that's the way they understood the world. If you had a lot of money, it means you were blessed by God. If you don't have a lot of money, if you're sick with MS, you must be cursed. That's called blaming the victim. Anyway, that's the way with such orthodox folk. Like the religious authorities in this morning's text from John's Gospel, today's Orthodox Christians cannot understand why Jesus cares at all for the poor. So they ignore 90% of his teachings, which are about justice for such people. Methodist pastor David Barnhart has this to say concerning arguments from so-called pro-life Christians who are forever championing the rights of the unborn but curiously have little concern for the born. Even for children who were put in cages along our southern border just a short time ago by someone they considered a Christian president. David, David's words are so clarifying as to be definitive on the subject. So if you're not listening to anything else, this pay attention. This is something. He says, you know... The unborn are a convenient group of people to advocate for. They never make demands on you. They are morally uncomplicated. Unlike the incarcerated, addicted, or the chronically poor, or the chronically poor, they don't resent your condescension or complain that you are not politically correct. Unlike widows, they don't ask you to question patriarchy. Unlike orphans, they don't need money, education, or child care. Unlike, you know, aliens from Mexico, they don't bring all that racial, cultural, and religious baggage that you dislike. They allow you to feel good about yourself without any work at creating or maintaining relationships. And when they are born, you can forget about them because they cease to be unborn. He says, you can love the unborn and advocate for them without substantially challenging your own wealth, power, or privilege, without reimagining social structures, apologizing, or making reparations to anyone. They are, in short, the perfect people to love if you want to claim you love Jesus, but actually dislike people who breathe. <laughs> Prisoners? Immigrants? The sick, the poor, widows, orphans, all the groups that are specifically mentioned in the Bible, they all get thrown under the bus for the unborn. Now, I don't want to be glib about the problems connected with abortion. Arguments on both sides of this debate are compelling. 
Arguments on both sides of this debate are compelling, but unlike the pro-life side, uh, but, excuse me, but until the pro-life side demonstrates that, that they can see the unborn, I'm speaking of children, for who they are, and also women, for, I meant to say the born, <laughs> but until the pro-life side demonstrates that it can see the born children for who they are, and also women for who they are in the eyes of Jesus, they lose the argument when measured by the teachings of our Lord. Now, I, I don't want the fact of, of moral blindness that anyone has to have the last word in a sermon that's really principally about optimism. So let me move on to, ironically, a word about the Holocaust. <laughs> hang in there, hang in there. Because, you know, this month, we find ourselves at the 77th anniversary of the liberation of the death camps of Europe. Uh, and as I said earlier, people who have sought evidence to dismiss the existence of a loving, purposeful God have most often pointed to the Holocaust, you know, as how did God let this happen? But, you know, at this date, we are still hearing more and more stories about remarkable acts of heroism. The hundreds of Oscar Schindlers, people whose example of moral courage during World War II warm and inspire all our hearts in the face of chronic instances of genocide everywhere. I heard most recently of the Orthodox Archbishop Andrew Sheptitsky of Lviv, Ukraine, that's the western part of Ukraine, who during World War II hid hundreds of Jews in his church and monasteries dressing them as monks and nuns. He never, he never stored their, uh, excuse me, he even stored their Torah scrolls and worship paraphernalia inside his church. And though hundreds of Christian monks and nuns knew of their presence in their community, not one of those Jews was ever betrayed, which is just a miracle. Because, you know, just a week ago, I visited Anne Frank's annex in Amsterdam. <clears throat> Excuse me. Things just sneak up on me in these sermons sometimes. Um, in Amsterdam, just last Saturday, uh, where she and eight others hid from the Gestapo for two years before being betrayed by one of her father's associates. And I'll tell you parenthetically, that is one deeply spiritual residence. So, you know, Andrew Sheptitsky did not hide behind the walls of his church. He could have. Instead, he published a pastoral letter denouncing na Nazi invaders, uh, and, and the piece was called, Thou Shalt Not Murder. He threatened any Christian with excommunication who would dare aid the Nazis in persecuting Jews. And to one of the Jews he harbored, who he disguised as a monk, he said these amazing words. He said, I want you to know that I do not expect any reward for your safety, nor do I expect you to accept my faith. In fact, I want you to be a good Jew. You see, I'm not saving you for your own sake. I'm saving you for the sake of your people. I find that to be such a profound Christian witness. I mean, the grace of Jesus just glows in that. So, I believe we have a perception problem about good and evil in this world. Evil is flashy, but you know, the good glows quietly forever. The Apostle Paul once wrote a letter from his prison cell in, in Rome. It would be his last public word to anybody as far as we know. He'd shortly be executed. His, his letter, in fact, suggests to us his knowledge of that fact, and yet he writes the following wonderful admonitions that call us to a living and radiant hope. He says, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, 
if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, this is not the power of positive thinking. Paul is about to be executed. And yet, I think he is saying that when you look at the whole canvas of life, you see that the good far outweighs the bad. The evil of this world should never be allowed to boast that it has the last word. We need to keep perspective. 14-year-old Anne Frank is remembered to have said, it's really a wonder that I haven't dropped all my ideals because they seem so absurd and impossible to carry out. Yet I keep them because in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. So finally, in the face of everything in this life that daily threatens to break our hearts, how comforting it is to think that in the long run, truth and love may well have the last word. What a welcome peace is available to us in the promise that God's goodness and mercy shall continue to pursue us down every one of our days. Amen.